Hello, I'm Kathleen McCann with the American College of Surgeons. Welcome to Mass Casualty Trauma Management Early Lessons from Beirut. Today we have four excellent speakers who will talk about their experience treating patients during and after the explosion in Beirut and discussing the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma Disaster Management Program. We welcome your questions during this webinar. Please use the chat function to send questions for our question and answer panel at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Kafrani, the um, chair of the International Relations Committee Subcommittee on Fellowship. Dr. Kafrani. Yes, uh, good morning and good evening to everybody all across the world. Um, on August 4th, Beirut experienced the largest urban explosion since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when almost 2,800 tons of ammonium nitrate detonated in the port area. In a city of 2 million citizens, more than 200 people died, almost 7,000 were injured, and hundreds were missing. The city's hospitals were severely damaged, with many patients injured or killed in the explosion and forcing multiple hospitals to evacuate their unharmed patients. However, in every disaster, we should look for those helping. There are always people helping. And today, we have three of the many people who helped that day to fly us in an hour and a half to be in their hospitals and see how it was like that day, managing the mass casualty disaster and learning from them about how to manage a similar situation if it happens in our own hospitals. There are many heroes, including those in the three other hospitals that manage hundreds of patients. And this is meant only to give a glimpse of that infamous day. This is a webinar that is co-sponsored by the American College of Surgeons International Relations Committee, as well as the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. We will have four presentations. Each one of them will be approximately 10 minutes. After that, we will have a 25 to 30 minute interactive Q&A session. So please, I encourage each one of you to write your questions in the chat or Q&A session as we go. And I will be screening all these questions and uh, using them for the Q&A session at the end. And I will direct them to the appropriate uh, speakers in the panel. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker to you today. Our first speaker is Dr. Jamal Hubbala, who is a professor of surgery at the American University of Beirut and the chairman of surgery at the American University of Beirut, as well as the president of the Lebanese Vascular Surgery Society. And he'll be talking to us about caring for the injured. Thank you, Dr. Kafarani. Thank you, ACS, IRC, and uh, COT for putting together uh, this webinar. Uh, on August 4, at 6.08 p.m., a catastrophic explosion rocked Beirut. It was named Beiroshima. The explosion was felt throughout Lebanon and even witnessed from neighboring countries. The explosion occurred at the Beirut port in Hangar 12. This is where it occurred before and after. It caused major destruction to the port and the surrounding areas. The explosion was attributed to 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, causing more than 220 deaths, at least 6,500 injured, many people still missing, more than 300,000 people were displaced, and more than $15 billion in property damage. The magnitude of the explosion is estimated to be around 1.155 metric tons of TNT, equivalent to 1.2 kilotons of explosive yield. Comparing it to other explosions, this is the Beirut warehouse contained more than 1,000 times ammonium nitrate than the truck used in the Oklahoma City bombing and was equivalent to dropping more than 100 mother of all bombs in the center of downtown Beirut. It was equivalent to 12% of Hiroshima in power. This is a map of the Beirut area and this is where the explosion site was. And these are three surrounding hospitals within less than one mile from the explosion that were all became dysfunctional and had to be evacuated. This is AU Medical Center where Dr. Safadi is. And this is the AB Medical Center, which is about 2.5 miles 
from the explosion. These are images from the various Beirut hospitals. A common theme is destruction and casualties. What I would like to do next is to share with you our experience at the American University of Beirut, share with you the challenges we face and some of the lessons learned. The American University of Beirut was established more than 150 years ago by US Protestant missionaries. It started as a small 200 bed hospital and grew to its multi-building medical center now, which is a accredited by the Joint Commission International and has magnet certification. All our residency program are accredited by the ACGME International. And we were the first in Europe and the Middle East to participate in the NSUIP. We had our own share of damages and these are pictures from outside the emergency room, emergency department, and from within it. The emergency room, uh, emergency department uh, registered more than 360 injured within the few hours of the injury. This is a space typically allocated for 42 patients. These patients of these, 270 were treated and released from the ED, nine were death on arrival, and 108 were admitted. Of these admitted, uh, 68 went to the operating room uh, within the next three days. In the first six to eight hours after the explosion, we did about 17 cases to treat life and limb threatening uh, conditions. The vast majority were craniotomies for head trauma. Three of these died uh, promptly in the EOR and recovery room. We had some threatened hands and partial amputations. We had two major multi organ injuries. One of them was to the heart and liver. And this is here you see Dr. Burji, one of our cardiac surgeons, fixing the hole in the heart. This patient had a liver injury. He survived those to die from his head injury. This other patient is doing well. In addition, we had to take care of other uh, emergencies that, that were not explosion related. One of them was a scalp reimplantation on a lady, 24 year old, who was on her way to the operating room to have an attempted microvascular reimplantation of her scalp after a factory injury. And her operation was put on hold when the explosion occurred. And we, once with the situation stable, we brought her back to the operating room for microvascular reimplantation. We also had to do a, an exploration for limb ischemia on a patient who that night had undergone a uh, major resection of a pelvic bony tumor and uh, she needed to have an iliac artery thrombectomy and a iliac vein bypass to treat her acute ischemia. On the following first day post explosion, we did 26 cases. The majority of them were orthopedic cases, all kinds of fractures from hip to ankle. And we did plastic surgery procedures, mainly um, tender repairs and soft tissue injuries. On day two, we continued to do orthopedic and plastic surgery uh, procedures. And by day three post explosion, we were able to catch up and had uh, the, some elective cases placed back on the schedule. One very interesting case we had was a patient who at another hospital had undergone a laryngectomy and aspirated major pieces of glass and was in respiratory distress. This patient has to be placed on ECMO in order to be able to remove those uh, pieces of glass safely from his tracheobronchial tree. What did we learn from these uh, experience? We learned that despite having all these, uh, our own disaster plan and having conducted many, numerous drills, all the disaster drills do not prepare you for this. Patients arrived at a pace bigger than can be handled with no identifying documents. Physicians, staff, friends, and relatives were among the injured. We could not properly register the injured patients. We had the registration clerks were too few to accommodate the pace and to be able to place them through our electronic medical system. And we had major uncertainty, not knowing what is coming next. We had lack of central coordination with other hospitals, other places in Beirut. As far as the injury type, it was variable from brain out of the head to uh, uh, globe, uh, uh, eye globe injuries, to abdominal extremities and lacerations, and they were major. We had major emotional shock and trauma to all involved. We had some security issues with difficulty in controlling the patient's relatives and their input into the ER. Patients and family were screaming, especially when they were identifying their loved ones as dead on arrival. I'll never forget the 70 year old man crying and weeping about the loss of his son. The death on arrivals were starting to line up on stretchers on their way to the morgue. And very few of the injured or transporters were wearing 
masks at a time when COVID was on the rise in Lebanon. In the middle of this chaos, though, however, there was no major panic. We did well with triage. We, has, we had experienced surgeons of all specialties, including trauma attendings and the ACS Region 17 Chief of Trauma and ED physicians in the ED deciding who needs to go to the OR, who goes to CT scan and x-rays with prompt management of lacerations using skin staples and prompt discharge of stable patients in anticipation for the arrival of additional casualties. We tried our best to apply ATLS principles as best as possible to all injured patients in primary and secondary surveys. We tried our best to maximize the use of our resources from staff and facility. All the surgeons independently made themselves available to AUB. Some could not get in due to blocked road and we had to bring one neurosurgeon on a motorcycle. We had a radiology attending available in the reading room. We used all the possible facilities at AUMC to separate patients in the different locations by severity. We used the recovery room as an ICU or pre-op area, opened the outpatient clinics to accommodate the patients and opened the minor surgery room in the surgery specialty clinics to take care of complex skin lacerations. We took care as best as possible of the safety of our patients and our staff. We were double checking the x-rays with the patients to make sure they matched. We had a senior surgeon rounding and double checking again for any missed or delayed injuries, and we tried our best to, to provide whatever protection we had for COVID, including gowns and masks. We had continuous communication with the OR nursing anesthesia and dealt expeditiously with the existing cases when the explosion occurred. We set the priorities in the OR and we stopped the elective schedule. We were thrilled that we were able to care for the non-explosion related emergencies. This is that lady who had the scalp pre-implantation and the lady who had that huge bony tumor resected after the flaps a few days later. So the lesson learned is that in planning, the disaster plan should anticipate an overwhelming mass casualty where routine communication channels will be disrupted. The routine patient registration and identification will be disrupted. Hence the use of simplest forms of identification, including writing on white papers or on the bed or even writing on the patient should be considered. You have to anticipate disruption of the, your usual OR facility and the need for maybe or have alternative OR facilities if your OR facilities are hit by the damage. You need to plan to allocate various areas of, for different level of injuries and you have to also plan the rare possibility to evacuate your hospital. In implementing your disaster plan, this experience taught us that the importance of the expertise in triage and decision making in the ED the importance of having senior administration available on premises for key decisions for space and resource allocation. The importance of staff mobilization promptly cannot be underestimated, nor the importance of communication within all teams, which is very essential, especially if there is central uh, communication and the central command center communication. You have to do that while ensuring security and staff of, and safety of your staff and patient and be prepared to improvise as needed. And in the aftermath, you need to replenish the supplies and resources as early as possible, anticipating a possible rise in communicable diseases. In our situation, we had a major rise in COVID-19 and the importance of the psychological and socio-economical support of the injured and non-injured cannot be underestimated. I wanna thank all our AV faculty, residents and nurses, for their support and all the support staff who helped in this disaster and hope no one will face such a catastrophe and hope we will rise back to our good old days and have you visit us someday. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Habala. That was, uh, that was definitely a lot uh, to absorb and, and I appreciate all the efforts that you guys did at the American University of Beirut to save a lot of lives that day. Uh, I encourage again all the attendees to write your questions as we go in the Q&A session and I'm reviewing them actively during the talks. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Basim Safadi. Dr. Safadi is a professor at the Lebanese American University and he's the chair of the Department of Surgery at the LAU Risk Hospital Medical Center and he will be talking to us about not only caring for the injured, but also caring for those who were not physically injured during the blast. Dr. Safadi. Thank you, Dr. Kafarani. Please allow me to thank the American College of Surgeons for giving us the opportunity to shed light on this humanitarian tragedy.
can seem to be uh, controlling the uh, slides. Try to click once and then advance. Okay, thanks. So mass casualties are on the rise worldwide, particularly in developing countries. They can result from natural catastrophes, acts of war or terrorism, industrial accidents, among others. The number of injured during a mass casualty events overwhelm the local and natural resources and will put enormous pressure on the healthcare system, putting patients who were not injured at risk. Managing a mass casualty event requires a great deal of preparedness that starts at the governmental level and branches out to provincial and local levels, including hospitals and medical facilities. It mandates immediate coordinated action at a command center at all of these levels. On the evening of August 4, 2020, we were not prepared at all for the Beirut blast. Lebanon emerged in the 1990s after a 15 year civil war with poor infrastructure and a dysfunctional system of government. Over the past 30 years, we've had more wars and influx of a million and a half Syrian refugees rampant corruption that led to further decay in our government system. We are now facing the worst economic and monetary crisis in Lebanon's history and our currency has devalued more than 600%. On top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic had just taken an aggressive turn with the rise in the number of cases and fatalities. So our healthcare system is for the most part dependent on the private sector and the governmental system is very poorly supported. So on that evening, we did not have a national emergency preparedness class for any disaster. Most hospitals in Beirut had wartime experience and could handle mass casualties, but none of their plans included the scenario where the hospital itself gets damaged. So when Dr. Kafarani asked me to talk about caring for the non-injured, I was not sure where to take this talk. Dr. George Julvekin will describe his own medical center's experience with caring for the non-injured patients that had to be evacuated from the hospital when his hospital was destroyed. Therefore, I decided to talk about the people who were not directly injured and who were not patients at the time. First and foremost, the non-injured should be provided with basic needs such as shelter, food, water, and security. Any ongoing source of danger should be controlled, whether it's fire, toxic fumes, potential infection, etc. People do not need mental or psycho psychological support early on, but many will certainly need it at the later stage as they recover from the acute stress. It is very important to help people pick up the pieces, recover their losses, help them stand up again, and provide them with hope and a sense of security for the future. So now allow me to share with you what we went through on the evening of August 4th. This aerial map that Dr. Khaballah showed earlier shows our medical center, which is a little over a mile away from the port. On the left hand of the screen, this little house depicts where we live about three miles away. So this was the scene at 6.08 p.m. from the hospital. We weren't sure what was happening. We were wondering whether this was an earthquake or an explosion. But as soon as we exited the hospital, stepping on rubble and broken glass, we started seeing smoke in the sky. And at that time, I knew this was a big explosion. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of explosions in Beirut, so I knew exactly what to do. I went straight to the operating room, changed into scrubs, preparing for the receipt of injuries. On the way, I spoke to my wife, who sounded distraught, but she assured me that she was okay, that our kids were okay, and we also made sure that the grandparents were okay. So that night, we took care of almost 400 patients. I managed to come home around 4 a.m., and my 15-year-old daughter was waiting for me. I could not hug her, although I wanted to, because I'd been in contact with so many people without protection, and I wasn't sure it was if I was exposed to coronavirus. But she started talking right away, at that time, she was reading her favorite Harry Potter book on the couch, right where you see that big lampshade. She felt the trembling first and then an intense pressure that blocked her ears. 
This large glass door slammed the door a few inches to her right as she sprinted toward, her, toward my wife. In the photo on the right, you can see the broken glass window. This is a specially laminated glass that keeps the glass pane in one piece even after it breaks. Years of war have taught me to install this specific glass in case of an explosion. So the next morning, Maya seemed okay. She checked on her grandparents and she was calling her friends. And I thought she was going to be okay, but it wasn't until five weeks later that I realized that she was not okay. Another big fire erupted in the port, and as soon as she saw the smoke and she realized it was coming from the port, she called me in tears, asking me to come home. My daughter's experience pales in comparison with the countless stories of injured kids, some who've witnessed the death of their parents. Stories of grandparents who are now caring for their grandkids after losing a son or a daughter. Stories of moms and dads who've lost their children. The scale of the psychological and mental trauma that affected so many people, especially children, is difficult to determine. We cannot talk about post-traumatic stress disorder because we are still experiencing the trauma of the blast. This was not a natural disaster, not an earthquake or a hurricane where you succumb to the will of the divine, this was not an act of war, at least that's what the preliminary evidence suggests. Thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate were stored for more than six years at Beirut's port without any oversight. As Alexandra's father described it, it was a murder of incompetence. People were hurt in their homes, the place where they should feel safe, and they were not prepared for this. Even today, we have not fully absorbed what happened and we did not grieve properly. We have just started to emerge from the initial phase of the trauma in which survival instincts prevail and where the main focus is in providing basic needs. Hundreds of thousands have lost their homes, countless more had to, had to make major costly repairs. Thousands have lost their source of income and businesses. Rania here in this photo is, our, is one of our family doctors. She and her family members survived miraculously. But she lost her clinic, she lost her home, and she basically lost all her savings. The Beirut blast severely damaged four major medical centers in the city, cutting down the city's bed capacity by a third. Two of those had major COVID-19 units that had to be evacuated, and this had put significant strain on an already struggling healthcare system. Unfortunately, today, a lot of doctors, nurses, and experienced healthcare professionals have decided to leave the country. The economic impact has been huge so far with direct losses estimated between 10 to 15 billion US dollars and likely serious losses down the line with the destruction of this big economic hub and with the loss of job opportunities. We will likely need decades to recover from this. It is said that Beirut was buried to the ground and rebuilt seven times. It has certainly witnessed a lot of destruction over the past 50 years, resulting in the loss of many of its historic landmarks. This Beirut blast damaged much of what has remained, but some of these buildings are being restored again thanks to the donations and the support of NGOs. These initiatives may, be, may seem secondary to many people at this time, but restoring heritage and memories is an important part of healing and moving forward. We've received a lot of help since the blast from so many countries. They have shipped planes carrying medicines, medical supplies, food and personnel. Several field hospitals were set up within a few weeks. Rescue teams were flown in from countries as far as Chile. We are truly thankful. Locally, in the absence of a reliable government, the true heroes are the volunteers that flocked from all over Beirut, all over Lebanon, removing the rubbles and helping injured residents with basic needs and with home repairs. To many non-injured, this was a form of therapy the ability to give in such times is rewarding and therapeutic. Despite the feeling of sorrow, grief, and anger, many of us still cling to hope and believe that Beirut will rise from the ashes again. We look forward to the support of the international community to help us move forward. And again, 
I would like to thank Haytham and the American College of Surgeons for giving us the opportunity to tell you about our experience with the Beirut class. Thank you. Dr. Savary, thank you again. I mean, I, uh, I'm glad people are putting the questions because it's a lot to absorb and uh, to moderate, to be honest. I'm glad they're taking the burden off my shoulders to have questions for you at the end. Um, without further ado, our third speaker is Dr. George du Juvelekian, who is a, a professor of medicine at the Balamand University and the chair of medicine at the St. George Hospital, one of the, uh, the major hospitals also in uh, in Beirut. And I think Dr. Juvelekian's talk is especially important for many reasons, as you will see, but St. George is one of the closest hospitals to the blast and was severely da damaged. And, uh, and also there was a personal injury to Dr. Juvelekian himself. So I'll, uh, I'll give him the podium and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Kafarani. Uh, I wish to uh, thank the uh, American College uh, of Surgeons for uh, extending this uh, opportunity to discuss uh, such a uh, hopefully um, not, never to be repeated calamity. Um, uh, as you mentioned, um, I uh, work at the uh, I work at the uh, Saint George Hospital University Medical Center. This is the picture of the original hospital. This is a hospital that's more than 140 years. Uh, uh, old, uh, it um, uh, still exists. Uh, this is uh, the old building. Uh, I will show you some pictures uh, on how it uh, has been also affected by the blast. Uh, this is a relic of the um, um, Civil War. Um, Dr. Safadi touched upon that when he mentioned that uh, we do have this memory uh, from the uh, Civil War that uh, to some extent was a part of the silver lining that uh, may have protected part of St. George Hospital as I will um, explain in the coming few slides. So as you can see here, the, the, this is a, an ICU room that was protected uh, on the outside by um, sandbags uh, for obvious reasons. This is um, the, the hospital I'm proud to belong to. It's St. George Hospital. It's a uh, large institution, uh, close to 400 uh, bed. It's a uh, university and teaching hospital. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, um, uh, the, root, uh, the uh, red uh, uh, rooftop, uh, the tiles. This is the original old uh, hospital that uh, is now being prepared to house uh, uh, the uh, simulation center of the new medical school. Uh, and this is, our hospital is, I think, the only one in Beirut that has a helipad on top of it. Uh, this turned out to be also a good thing because when they were uh, doing the uh, structural um, evaluation of the building to make sure that it does sustain uh, a, hel a helipad, uh, the structure was felt to be uh, prepared for a, uh, a seismic uh, um, um, magnitude greater than the blast and the shockwave we've witnessed. This is the facade of the hospital that was facing the harbor and um, uh, it's about 0 0.6 miles uh, straight shot from the uh, um, uh, blast area and it has nothing in front of it. That's why it kind of absorbed all the uh, shock wave. This is how it looked like at 6.06, .06, I guess, uh, on that uh, uh, fateful night. And uh, these are typical um, uh, patient uh, rooms. And this is the blast and this is the shock wave. Uh, it's being repeated here in slow motion. And you can actually appreciate uh, what happens to the glass windows on the buildings. This is taken from one of the uh, buildings that are next to the hospital. You can, you can see the, the mass impact of the shock wave, um, I guess. This is our helipad. This is one of our um, cameras that kept rolling uh, uh, throughout the blast because the um, hospital is equipped with a UPS system. Again, another relic of the, um, uh, I guess, uh, the fact that we don't have 24-hour electricity. And that's why uh, it actually um, uh, kept rolling for about maybe uh, an hour into it. We'll touch upon that later on when we talk about lessons learned. This is the main entrance. And of course, you can appreciate uh, the, um, uh, the blast moments. Again, another uh, picture from the main entrance. This is a few uh, feet away from the other. This is the entrance to the emergency department. Uh, so this is, and this is our ER. Uh, this is the main uh, uh, emergency uh, uh, room, uh, uh, one of the sections, and this is the other section. Um, so um, I guess uh, this is this is important because that's the that's our nursery. I'll touch upon that later on when I talk about how um, uh, the evacuation of uh, the hospital occurred and uh, 
it will probably uh, uh, make it uh, a bit more concrete on uh, what may have been uh, a bit of uh, luck with uh, some preparedness and uh, a lot of, uh, um, you know, heroism, if you will. This is uh, immediately after the blast, the main entrance. And this, this is my clinic. So this was my clinic. I was sitting in that chair in the center there and the whole um, uh, glass uh, aluminum uh, facade kind of ripped off and uh, flew in, uh, uh, hitting me on the side of the head. And I was very, very fortunate because I only sustained facial fractures and uh, a big laceration. Uh, it spared my eye and uh, my brain, uh, but that's essentially what uh, we were dealing with. And this was uh, system-wide. The whole hospital was uh, damaged like this. this is the, 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 the picture in the middle is my ICU main hall. So um, it's a 14-bed uh, ICU and this is how it looked like. And from the window on the left-hand side, you can see what happened to the old building and the rooftop uh, tiles, how they ripped off because of the shockwave. Uh, this is uh, again the entrances and I want to uh, try to emphasize what happened in terms of the uh, amount of damage. So all the hallways were blocked. Mind you, this occurred at 6.07 and an hour after that, it was gonna get dark and two hours after that, it was pitch black and there was essentially uh, no uh, generators because they were affected by the blast. Uh, this is what happened in the aftermath. So you have a shock, patient, people uh, got out of the shock, uh, uh, some heroes emerged, if you will, and they start taking over. They start organizing things and uh, they had to use um, uh, the uh, uh, megaphones, if you will, the uh, uh, loudspeakers because the um, uh, cell phone, uh, uh, most of them were down um, and uh, they used the cell phones for flashlights because they used them to evacuate patients. So you had four kinds of people to deal with. You had inpatients that need to be evacuated. You had injured inpatients you had the uh, personnel and uh, physicians and uh, attendings, residents, fellows, and the uh, employees that had to be taken care of, they were injured. And you had people flocking into the hospital's ER because they were injured and they thought that that's a, the place to go to because this is the natural thing to do. And uh, may I uh, say that for the first time in its over 140 year history, St. George Hospital would got completely off grid because all 10 floors above ground were uh, taken out of service. Um, so within about 30 minutes, uh, the things started uh, getting uh, a bit organized. This is the ER before, this is immediately after. And uh, the, some of the physicians who took over, this is our chief of staff, Dr. Azar in the middle, who was starting to organize things and uh, dispatching people to do various tasks. One group was sent to um, uh, secure all the hazardous areas. So the um, um, elevator shafts, we had 16 elevators, all the, all the doors were blasted off. So they had to be secured uh, because they were uh, hazardous areas. All the oxygen uh, sources were to be shut and the main oxygen valve was uh, uh, shut also. The diesel, the, the fuel oil and the other uh, hazardous materials had to be uh, secured and shut. This was done by the hospital personnel and uh, people were also being evacuated. So here you can see that uh, on the left hand side, some residents, uh, some of them injured were carrying patients on the uh, uh, um, uh, false ceiling uh, tolls, uh, using them as um, uh, 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 means of ma managing patients. And on the right hand side, right hand side, it was the same happening within the uh, sheets of the bedding. Uh, uh, same here. One of the doors that blasted the uh, iron doors, the patients were being moved. Uh, with those. And in front of the ER, you had a, um, another open air ER where patients were being intubated, cared for, resuscitated, and uh, resources were being allocated to serve different areas. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, parking lot the next to the hospital was made into a field hospital, if you will, to serve that area. I was showing you that picture of uh, the blasted area and the nursery. This is one of our nurses um, in the uh, pediatric ICU. She took the triplets and she walked for three miles uh, to get them to safety at another facility over rubble. This is one of our residents uh, and uh, this is what he had to say. Maria So I had to get up. I put my hand on the ground. I was I had to get بلا ضوء بلا شيء بتذكر كثير منيح في مريض كنت حاطط سيلولاري بتنه هين شو هيك وعم ضوي بالفلاش على تمه وعم اقتبله من هون 
ومن هون ومن رقبته ومرته فوق راسي عم تصرخ وتعيط تترجاني انه بليز 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 هو عم ينزف بشكل كثير مش طبيعي يعني بعد نص ساعه صراحه دخت وغبت عن الوعي بالطوارئ مريا ما قدر So he went unconscious. Why? Because he had uh, three fractured ribs, had a pneumothorax, and he's lucky to be alive because he could have had a, uh, um, uh, 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 a cardiac arrest, essentially, from patient pneumothorax. What are the, the events that made the difference? The hospital structure, in terms of concrete, was made to sustain such damage, so this it was lay, uh, left un, uh, unscathed. Getting out of the initial shock was quick. Uh, people emerged, took over. They secured the hazardous areas. The uh, others manage the human part. The sense of duty superseded all else. I guess that's kind of obvious from what we saw from this resident and our nurse that took care of that. And uh, um, uh, I guess it does make sense then to uh, probably have this time. So it kind of blew inside and it hit me on the side of my face. Professor Georges Juvelekian was in his clinic at the time. He told me he just finished a consultation. Had my colleague not picked me up from here, I could have bled to death. Who knows? We should be proud of what we've done. <coughs> what this hospital did in eight hours, evacuating over 300 patients to safety, despite the lack of power and glass everywhere and unsafe environment and no resources, is a miracle by itself and speaks to the greatness of this people. So what are the lessons learned? We have to be prepared for any disaster, even the hard to imagine like this one. UPS uh, should not be centralized. Uh, that was one of the things we're working on as we speak. False ceilings should be made uh, from uh, plastic or PVC, not steel or uh, metal. All glass windows should be laminated as Dr. Safadi did in his uh, uh, house, uh, thankfully. Uh, emergency power flights should be made available in all different sections and parts of the hospital. Uh, we are working on developing an alternate communication system since the cellular networks were not to be relied upon and they became patchy. Uh, foldable structures should be made available on each and every floor, more than we already have. And again, a relic of the uh, maybe civil war, should we move our ICU back to the sub-basement? Mind you, our OR, the operating theater, the uh, cath laboratory, and the uh, archives, uh, and the, uh, uh, some other sections are all underground like diagnostics. Uh, part, I guess, of the relic of the civil war. Hospital security personnel should be expanded to secure areas and premises and equipment and guide the evacuation process. And we should keep complete patient lists redundant because we had a bit of trouble calling each and every patient the following day to track them, make sure they all got to safety. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. And I hope that uh, what we went through, no one has to go through and that the lessons we learn can uh, help us serve our community better. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Juvelakian, and I'm, I'm glad you're safe. Uh, seeing your picture injured is definitely uh, something that, that goes to heart. Um, you know, evacuating your hospital is not something any of us really prepared to. So I, you know, will have a lot of questions at the end. Our uh, last speaker is is no stranger to many of us. Is Dr. Eileen Bulger. She is the chair of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, and she is the Trauma Director at Harborview Medical Center and a friend of many of us, uh, of many of us uh, in the trauma world. And sometimes it takes uh, people to step away from the, the disaster and the field to, uh, to see if we can come up with common lessons that we learned from prior disasters, but we could also learn from here so that, you know, the, the real disaster only if we don't learn from what happened to prevent loss of life in the future to come. So she'll be talking to us about disaster preparedness. What can we do? Dr. Bulger? Thank you, Dr. Kafrani. And I really want to thank our speakers for those incredible talks. They're very moving and I think highlight the real heroes in this response. Uh, on behalf of the Committee on Trauma, uh, you know, we, we, we reach out, we feel for you, we want to support you. And I think uh, this is one of the most important things that we can do, which is to try to capture the lessons learned from these events and, and help us all think through how we could prepare for something such as such tragedy as this to occur in our own communities. So I really want to thank you for that. Uh, uh, Lebanon is in Region 17 of the Committee on Trauma, and in fact, the Region 17 chief is Dr. George Abisad, who was also involved in the response. And so we, uh, we are uh, very much a family in the surgical trauma community. 
after one of our greatest tragedies in the United States, the, the 9-11 uh, events, uh, there was a, a detailed uh, debriefing and after action review. And this is a quote from that report uh, and where they said the greatest failure on 9-11 was the failure of imagination. And I think that that strikes me with this event as well. None of us imagined that something like this magnitude could happen in our city or our region. Uh, uh, with that much damage to our facility that we would need to evacuate. So I think that this, one of the key lessons here is that this event teaches us of the importance of the need to imagine the worst possibilities as we prepare our healthcare system to try to respond to these types of events. In fact, there have been 35 major events, uh, not non-intentional events, um, that were related to ammonium nitrate explosions uh, since 1916. Uh, this is a picture from Texas City in 1947. Uh, again, a port where a major uh, explosion occurred from ammonium nitrate, killing 581 people and injuring 5,000. So these events happen over time. We don't tend to remember them. Most of us weren't around in 1947. But I think that, again, this is an opportunity for us to imagine the worst possible thing as we do, as we do our disaster preparedness. These disasters with ammonium nitrate most commonly occur in transportation areas, in ports, on railways, but can also occur on highways during transportation of uh, this chemical. So it is important to think that everybody could be at risk. Uh, also, if you are near industrial areas that deal with ammonium nitrate, such as fertilizer plants, that can create a significant uh, risk as well. And in addition to these, what are thought to be sort of accidental explosions or non-intentional explosions. Ammonium nitrate has also been used intentionally. Uh, this is the Murr Federal Building uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, where a single car bomb, uh, which was uh, packed with ammonium nitrate, uh, you can see uh, caused a large uh, uh, structural collapse of the building uh, with 168 deaths and 759 injured from a single car bomb. So we have to be thinking about how we deal with these very massive explosions that can happen uh, uh, pretty much anywhere. So, you know, as we think about tra traditionally the phases of disaster response, when something occurs, there's always chaos. And I really like the quote um, that there was chaos, but there was not panic. I think that's critically important. If the more we can prepare ourselves for these types of events, the least likely we are to have panic. Uh, we, we can jump into a mode where we know what to do, we know how to triage, we know how to deal with the safety risks in our hospital, as, what, as was alluded to, uh, and we can, can try to control the chaos. That is the best we can do in this scenario as we respond to a disaster event. There's certainly a long recovery phase, as we've heard, there's still a lot more recovery to be done. Uh, and then there's mitigation and prevention. And I think, again, one of the things we, we want to look at it in these types of events is how can we prevent them from occurring in the future? Uh, after the Texas City uh, explosion, there were significant uh, laws passed that changed the storage requirements for ammonium nitrate uh, to try to prevent these events. And so, again, worldwide, this is something we need to look at to see how we can prevent uh, these tragedies from occurring. So there's a real framework around disaster preparedness. There are many things uh, that we can work on. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes we see these events and we think what a, a, a huge tragedy, but what can we do? You know, these things happen, but I think there is a lot we can do. Uh, and as healthcare providers and, and surgeons who are committed to caring for injured patients, we should be engaged in this work. So prevention I've already talked about, but there's preparation and planning, imagining all the possibilities uh, planning for the worst case scenario. There's working with our pre-hospital system and our bystanders. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the, one of the college programs around Stop the Bleed, but there's training we can do for bystanders in the community uh, who are going to jump in and help. They are heroes as well. We can organize our search and rescue efforts. We can train and triage. There's a lot we can do in hospital preparedness and, and the hospitals in this scenario were, were very prepared from their previous experiences but that's not the case everywhere in the world. I'll talk a little bit about regional coordination, uh, which I think is particularly important in, in large events. And then as individuals, we can get trained. We should understand the pathophysiology of blast injury, the injury patterns associated with things that we don't see commonly like radiation exposure, uh, things that, uh, that we have to deal with as physicians. 
uh, an unusual circumstance. And then I think the most important thing we can do also in our hospitals is, is conduct realistic drills. A lot of drills, you know, are sort of tabletop, you know, pass a piece of paper around and imagine what would happen if you moved a bunch of patients. But really, if we bring in large numbers of, of uh, moulage victims into our emergency departments in a very rapid fashion and then have to, have to involve the entire hospital, have to activate our operating room, have to get patients moved around the hospital to our operating rooms, to our ICUs, uh, how are we going to accommodate them? Where's the staff coming from? I think those give us opportunities to really push the system to failure and that's the time to do it. As was mentioned, we're in the midst of another ongoing mass casualty event and that's the COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected the entire world. Uh, and the United States has been hit particularly hard as well. Uh, you know, I think that uh, well, one of the things that we have learned uh, already in this response is that there is incredible value in regional coordination and some of our uh, states do that better than others. Um, but if you look at the three main groups that need to work together uh, in this response, it's public health, emergency management, and our acute healthcare systems. And while these may be really high functioning, they're not used to working together in a coordinated way, particularly over a long period of time. We think the solution to that is something we call, we call a regional medical operations center. The other term that's often used for this uh, from our federal government is the medical operations coordination center. Uh, but this is something that uh, has been used in uh, states, uh, particularly like Texas, where they see a lot of uh, hurricanes and frequent uh, disasters. They have to evacuate hospitals from the coast in anticipation of hurricanes. And so they set up an infrastructure which engages all the hospital systems in the region with representatives that can come together very quickly uh, and, and are on the same computer platform to collect data across all the hospitals. This allows really situational awareness of what's happening, uh, coordination among the hospitals and the pre-hospital agencies that move patients, and allows you to essentially level load a, a hospital system. Again, not something that's going to be useful in the first few minutes after a disaster response, but in a longer term event, or in a situation where patients need to be moved over a large distance or a large area, this type of coordination can be incredibly valuable. So we have some resources here for you. Um, one that's on the college website that we've put together on basically what an ARMOC is and how you can start to build this resource in your community. And there's also some resources on the Asper Tracy website, which is the Federal Disaster Preparedness Group from the United States. Uh, and uh, these are uh, freely available for you to look at. So as an individual, what can you do? Uh, you know, I think one of the most important things we all can do is teach the Stop the Bleed course. This is a worldwide campaign uh, that uh, really was launched in an effort to teach basic citizens the basics of bleeding control. Just like we teach CPR, we teach how to hold pressure on a wound, how to pack a wound, and if you have a tourniquet, how to use that. Uh, you know, this can be a life-saving maneuver, and in these types of scenarios where, again, the healthcare system is clearly overrun, uh, that person standing next to you is holding pressure on your groin can make a big difference. Um, we, as individuals, again, can seek training. There's a couple of courses here. There's lots of other courses available, but these are courses that the college is involved with. Uh, one is around how to better prepare your hospital, that's the DMAP course, and the other is around how to better prepare yourself as an individual, and we're actually working on combining these two into an online format as we speak. You can do a risk assessment in your area for what uh, things that you should be imagining. Uh, you can engage in your local planning and preparedness. You can advocate for resources, which are hard to come by when, when you're not in a disaster. And then think about your regional coordination efforts. I'll end with this last slide, which uh, shows you uh, just some pictures of various Stop the Bleed courses uh, all around the world. Uh, this program has been incredibly um, uh, uh, beneficial and really widely adopted, very much like ATLS has been adopted around the globe. Uh, this is an easy thing to, to teach. It's fun. It's a great way to interact with your community. We currently have documentation of over 1.5 million people that have been trained. Uh, there's probably a lot more that we just don't capture in our course system. Uh, it's in 116 countries. So this is something that everybody can do to really teach people uh, how to be that uh, skilled bystander when, when they're needed. So um, again, I'm gonna stop there, but I do wanna thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today, to hear the stories, to hopefully set us up to be better prepared should this ever happen again. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Bulger. Uh, very, very informative talk and also kind of gathering all the, the different parts of the story and how can we come up with something positive out of it. So I, I personally appreciate it and I definitely think uh, in Lebanon, uh, perhaps we can all get together and see how we can get Stop the Bleed. Uh, there have been success stories of getting ATLS and other training courses in, in Lebanon and perhaps the time is right for that. Um, before I, you know, I, we start going through the question, I just want to give my utmost respect to, to all of the speakers, uh, particularly the three of you from Beirut. I know for each one of you that presented today, there's probably five or ten who could also tell all the heroic stories from what happened that day. Um, but I appreciate what, what you guys shared with us. I know it wasn't easy for you. And there was a whole bunch of comments from all over the world. I saw some I recognized from as far as Brazil, uh, North America, Africa, Europe, Middle East, as, as well as Asia and Australia of people just, you know, kind of putting their hats off for you. So uh, we're not going to go through all these comments, but I want to go through some of the questions and some of them are really, really amazing questions. I'm just going to try to go through all the questions that we have one by one. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to ask each one of you to try to limit the response to one minute. If it's something you have something really meaningful to add, please, for, for, uh, for all practical purposes, take your time. But I'll ask each question. I'll direct it to one person in specific. And then if uh, one of you wants to add after they finish, please do weigh in. Um, the first question I see on the panel is from Jessica Burgess. And it's what kind of triage system did you use to determine who would go to the ICU or who would get priority to the operating room? Who made these decisions? Um, and I'm gonna add to this question, the fact that something we know very well in trauma is what kills the patient is not the obvious. I can only imagine the screams and the people who are injured. And those people are usually those that are gonna survive. They're injured and their injuries are meaningful, but they will survive. The scare is usually comes from the quiet patient that's sitting in the corner and nobody is giving attention to that patient. So what kind of triage system did you have? Was it trauma surgeons or what, what was it ED physicians? And, and, and I would appreciate maybe Dr. Habala starting the answer, but that's a question I'd like everybody maybe to weigh in on. Uh, thank you, uh, Haitham. Uh, the key issue here was that we had senior faculty members in the ED doing the triage. So uh, the experience of these surgeons was tremendous in helping us in deciding who needs to go to the operating room. And the first priority was to those who had head trauma and looked like they were uh, having neurological changes that might be having um, uh, hematomas that need to be evacuated or those who had uh, brain coming out of their skull, that was very clear they need to go to the, to, the, to the operating room. And this is how things were directed. So unstable patients uh, went directly to the operating room if, or to the, to the CAT scan, uh, which was present in the ER. So that was fairly expeditious. And uh, this is how the decision was made. Now we had many uh, seasoned trauma surgeons and we had different bays and each bay had uh, a senior surgeon kind of leading or a senior person leading it. There were also ED physicians leading other bays. And if they identified someone in their area that needed to go to the operating room, I think this is how they uh, immediately notified the specialty or the surgeon and we coordinated that. So we had a reasonable coordination between the ED physicians and the trauma surgeons. Uh, and I think one of the key decision was who needs to go to the operating room. And this is where we all coordinated this effort. Who needs to go to the operating room was the first question determined by specifically, typically the surgeon who's going to take them to the operating room. Dr. Safari. Uh, thank you very much, Haysan. So uh, again, when you're faced with, uh, you know, hundreds of patients all at the same time, it's quite difficult to, to come up with a, with a clear cut uh, screening strategy, but the level of consciousness comes first. So people who actually were talking and were, were at least, uh, we made sure that they're okay. Anyone who had a, a level of consciousness that was suboptimal, there was a red flag. So we either got them immediately to the scanner or to a monitored area. The next thing to do is just look for obvious bleeding and the bleeding that cannot be controlled by simple pressure goes to the OR for exploration. 
anything that can be controlled in the ER will stay in the ER. And the third would be any visible deformity, somebody with a gaping wound or bone sticking out or something like that would go straight to the, to the uh, OR. And the problem is with the large number of patients, we were unable to get their vital signs quickly enough, but obviously any patient with a low blood pressure would also take priority in, in screening to either a controlled area or to the OR. Very good. Uh, Dr. Juvelikian, I'm going to give you a different question. Is, uh, the, this question is from Todd Nicholson. It says, what type of emergency management training is required for leaders in the hospitals located in Beirut? Um, yeah, well, thank you again for the opportunity. And yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure about uh, you know, the other centers in the city. I'm sure uh, AUVMC and uh, uh, it is a, a hospital and a U uh, medical center. They have something similar. We do have an emergency preparedness plan. We do have a, an, uh, a, a department that deals with uh, different scenarios, including disaster management and disaster management at different levels, not just uh, something like this, but also, um, you know, hazardous material, the infectious uh, problems, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, the person responsible for it is uh, a gentleman by the name of George Saad, and he's actually not Abi Saad, that's George Saad. And he, he's actually um, uh, a, a seasoned uh, uh, gentleman who uh, coordinates uh, with the uh, UNIFIL, for example, uh, and uh, coordinates the transport and transfer of patients and does drills on disaster management uh, uh, regularly uh, in, uh, at the uh, uh, St. George Hospital in something called the LEAM, the Lebanese European uh, Association of Medical Emergencies. And uh, it has different programs that cater to such needs. But even when uh, he uh, uh, believed that he was capable of dealing with something like this, it was a bit difficult to uh, imagine the uh, magnitude of what happened. Because after all, you, you need to have something to start with and uh, you do rely that certain areas may still be intact and that was really not the case that day. So even someone like George who was working, uh, um, he, he actually got back to the center 26 minutes later. And even for him, it was a challenge. So we do have programs in place, but I guess they need to be uh, fine-tuned again based on what happened. My next question is, I'm gonna direct to Dr. Bulger. It's from Stephanie Berry. It's the, the question is, could the panel, and I'm directing this question to you, could you give suggestions for best practices as it relates to drilling mass casualty triage? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And I think that, you know, drilling is probably the most important thing we can do. It takes um, investment in time and resources to really make it realistic. But to the extent that we can do that, the better. Um, you know, that we actually use real people that are volunteers, then we moulage them with injuries like we do for ATLS training. And we bring them in in large numbers and really work with our staff to learn those principles of triage uh, I think is really valuable. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a lot different doing it with a huge number of people in front of you and screaming and yelling and chaos um, than it is on a piece of paper, you know, sort of working through a drill. So to me, the, the more realistic we can make our drills, the better. Any, anybody else wants to add about the drilling question from your experience? Uh, feel free, Dr. Fabala, maybe. Actually, we had uh, several drills uh, conducted, but I can tell you that, uh, um, you know, when, when this massive amount of patients come together, uh, it, 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 uh, sometimes it's so tough to handle. Nevertheless, the more drills you do, I fully agree, the more drills you do, the more uh, prepared you will be. So I think uh, investing in drills is essential. The next question is coming if from, I may, if Sorry, I may, go ahead, Dr. Jubal again. Uh, yeah, because th that's something we witnessed. I mean, it was interesting that uh, the people that helped the most in the evacuation process amid this disaster were people that I thought were not prepared for it in terms of 
formal drills. So these were residents, so they were nurses, they were uh, uh, fellows, they were uh, people that you would think uh, were not prepared, that, that would need to be uh, chaperoned. So I guess what matters the most is to have a couple of key individuals who would be able to keep a cool head and then, uh, like Dr. Burgess, uh, uh, the, the, the Dr. Bargill said, uh, chaos but not panic. So I think this is very important. And then you improvise. And I think uh, the only way I can explain how we managed to empty the hospital despite all the circumstances is that there was no panic. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of damage and everything, but uh, people did what they could. So uh, like, like everybody's saying, drills are important, but uh, maybe the, uh, the, the culture of keeping a cool head and trying to uh, um, manage uh, uh, which, with what you have. So um, the, the, this actually ties in very nice into the next question by Mark Gustring, which is, you know, before I say the question, it, what you guys are saying reminds me of a saying in a book called The House of God. It says, in a, in a cardiac arrest, the first pulse to check is your own. And that's really important in, uh, in, in managing and triaging disaster situations like that. So the question is from Mark Gestring. It says, Please talk about how you balance concern for your own family during events like this. I would suspect that you and your hospital staff would also be personally impacted by what happened. How did you handle this? I know Dr. Safadi briefly uh, mentioned that. I'm going to start with you if you want to tell us, you know, maybe share us your mindset in the time where you're worried about your family. At the same time, you have a duty to the hospital. And perhaps I could have after that Dr. Hobala and Dr. Jovalikian comment on it. Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, in that sense, I, I think I was lucky because I, I uh, was able to call uh, my family within minutes. You know, sometimes in natural disasters or other uh, disasters, the telephone system could be completely shut off. So you could be actually working without any knowledge about your family's condition. And that could be disturbing. I know a lot of my colleagues who actually saw the very close uh, family members in the ER, sometimes without even... Uh, knowing ahead of time. So uh, I guess it's our duty as, as healthcare professionals to, to try to keep our cool down, to stay as objective as possible, and uh, trying to balance the two can be sometimes tough. Thank you, Hopala. I think, uh, again, the first thing that comes to mind when this thing happens is you call your immediate family and try to make sure they are uh, safe and uh, Actually, in my situation, I tried and I could not get hold of uh, uh, of uh, my wife and son. And then uh, finally was able to get hold of my uh, mother-in-law who told me that they were fine. And that was a major reassurance to, uh, to, uh, to at least get one thing off your mind and focus on others. Uh, but at the same time, you need to keep your head uh, cool. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, you just have to... Uh, Keep, keep, your, keep your calm because especially in a leadership position, if you are losing your calm, then things become not just chaotic, but panicky. And you just have to find those who can do the best, do what, the be what best they can do, as also mentioned by uh, George. Uh, identify those uh, good individuals, those ex expert individuals who can lead different areas. And this way you can um, you can isolate and uh, uh, provide the best care possible. Uh, George, let me, let me ask you, in, in your case, it was a little bit different. It wasn't family. You were injured yourself. How did mm -hmm. you try to balance you needing somebody to take care of you versus taking care of others? Yeah, and that's actually, I was going to say, uh, I, I, um, it's putting a twist on things. It's interesting that um, I guess in our formation as uh, physicians who actually are caregivers, uh, quote unquote healers, uh, and as you could see from the videos in my presentation, uh, people were, uh, you know, residents and fellows and attendings and everything were caring for injured people, even when they were themselves injured. Uh, we had a midwife who had a broken arm who was still working, assisting others. Uh, my fellow Ismail actually had three uh, broken ribs and had a pneumothorax and was still assisting until he collapsed himself. I, I did have this, you know, the presence of mind to call my daughter and tell her I'm injured, but okay, and shut the phone. And the same for my wife saying, I'm injured and shut the phone. <laughs> but then, but after that, like I said, you just don't think about yourself. You just 
uh, it's, it's almost automatic. Something clicks in and you start working and doing what you do best, which is try to help others. This is a culture that, uh, for better or worse, is ingrained in us, I guess. You're all heroes in my eyes. My, the next question by Yuki Julius, and it's, uh, I'm going to direct it to Dr. Bulger, is how can countries set up a disaster response? I know that question probably requires two-hour seminar by itself, but perhaps you could give people a lead if, if they don't have a disaster response at a national level, where do they start? Yeah, it's really tough. And I think, it, of course, it varies from, from place to place. Um, I think the first thing to do is to try to figure out what the current resources are. You know, there's usually some group that is working on, on disaster response for a country or a state or a region. Um, and identify who's working on it and what they're doing. Uh, and then, you know, I think that there are strategies to think about uh, how we coordinate amongst ourselves. If we can bring all the stakeholders to the table, if you can get you know, for the healthcare system in particular, representatives from all the hospitals, from your, from any pre-hospital agencies that you have that do transport uh, and, and get together and just sort of work through what's, what are the greatest risks in our region? It's called a hazard assessment, you know, and then how would we deal with them and start to take it piece by piece. Uh, it, but it requires really a strong collaboration of people working together, thinking out, uh, in advance of the worst case scenario, and then trying to figure out what the resources are that could be brought to bear in that setting. Uh, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is it requires some investment. You need to invest in communication infrastructure, you know, you need so that you, so the communication breaks down, cell phones are down as they almost always are, that you have another way to communicate. Um, you know, requires some investment in, in those resources, but uh, if you can convince, you know, your government that that's important uh, based on all these events that we see over and over again uh, all around the world. Uh, that lives will be saved. Uh, but it is, a, it is a heavy lift, especially if there's not a lot of, uh, of infrastructure already uh, underway. I uh, have a question from Reem Basile, who seems her brother was injured uh, during this. I'm going to tackle this question. Um, it seems she's worried about her brother and how he's doing. He thinks he's okay. All I'm going to tell Reem is acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder are extremely well described after trauma. And I encourage her to have a, a, a professional psychologist evaluate her brother and see if he can help. The uh, next question we have is from Mike Malah and says, did each hospital set up an incident command center to centralize the response? Also, was there an early attempt to close down the, the, the area around the hospital or emergency room to filter the worried well uh, the worried well patients. So I'm going to give this question to Dr. Fabala first. Well, we were unable to put a total uh, uh, blockage of the surrounding uh, to our hospital. I mean, uh, no, we could not do that. Uh, so uh, uh, this is this was uh, this was this was not possible. Um, the uh, main the main uh, support was to provide. Uh, I mean, as much as, as possible, we had uh, patients being brought in by, uh, by so many different means, so we could not really block the entrance to the hospital or, or block it from, any, uh, from, from, from other areas. We, we had to be open all the way. All right, the next comment, I'm, it's, a, it's a question comment by Khalid Abdul Jawad asking about, you know, is it time to have a, a, a comprehensive trauma system in Lebanon. And I actually, I, I totally agree with Khaled. I think if we don't do it after this event, when do we do it? I personally been raising that question for years and uh, we know how sometimes it's hard to get things uh, through the governance system, but I think it's time to, to do that. So I'm, um, I'm gonna move to the next question is by Elena Salman. And it's what are the greatest issues or concerns the medical facilities in Beirut are facing in the aftermath of the explosion at this time and going forward. I'm gonna give this question to Dr. Safadi first and if Dr. Juvalikian or Dr. Habala wants to add, please do. So in context of what's happening in Lebanon, uh, our biggest problem is the uh, economic and monetary problems we are having. So uh, uh, all hospitals need financial support um, we are having uh, difficulty getting medical supplies uh, promptly and at uh, uh, reasonable prices. 
a lot of our healthcare professionals, uh, because of the repetitive wars and uh, economic hardship, and now this blast are leaving. So we are starting to experience a drain of experienced healthcare professionals. And on top of that, it just happens that our COVID-19 pandemic is just now on the rise. So these are the three main issues is the, uh, the uh, manpower drain, the lack of resources and the COVID-19. Yes, um, I, I would, I would uh, definitely agree. And I think uh, as uh, Dr. Safadi said, the biggest problem I think is the uh, um, uh, human resource, um, not just physicians, but also with skilled nurses. So like, for example, in my ICU, uh, my limitation at the moment uh, is not just the facility, which has been severely damaged, but even if I were to expand to uh, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, wishful capacity, uh, I will have a problem with the shortage of skilled uh, ICU nurses. And that's a problem we're going to be facing in Lebanon in the coming probably uh, foreseen future, because we've kind of uh, dropped into a low resource country, uh, as uh, Basim uh, said. And on top, uh, St. George Hospital has been probably the hardest hit. Uh, the estimated uh, initial uh, uh, requirements for it to go back to what it was before the blast is close to $45 million. And uh, this number after, uh, you know, the economic crisis uh, that we're in now is taking a whole new uh, dimension on its own. So overall, it's, it's really multifaceted. I, in I, I, fully, I fully agree. And in addition to that, we need to realize that many people had uh, ultimately got some major disabilities from the injuries and may require further surgeries in the future, in addition to rehab and others. So in addition to the supply and, uh, uh, and uh, what may be missing in uh, equipments and supplies in hospitals, I think we have a big patient population with limited uh, insurance supply and uh, in, uh, health coverage who will continue to need further healthcare and uh, rehabilitation and possible further surgeries. And that's going to be a major problem as well. Right, uh, uh, there is a command by Alexander Eastman in Texas who would recommend that the lessons learned be compiled into a document with an executive su summary, not only for publishing, but to be circulated. I could not agree uh, any more with uh, Alex and I actually uh, think we should also be collecting the data on everybody that's injured. We cannot improve what we do not measure. And I do think we're trying to do that among all the hospitals in Beirut, so more to come. Um, there's a, a, there's a, a question that I want a yes and no answer followed by a number. By Narayan Ayer is asking, was there any burn injuries? If so, how many? So Dr. Juvelikian, do you know the answer in your hospital? Very few, if at all. The, the major disaster was the uh, glass charts. Okay, Dr. Habala, any burns? No. And Dr. Safadi, any burns? And no burns. Okay. I think a lot of the people who were burned actually were dead on arrival. That's my understanding from, uh, from talking to a lot of people. A question that came by quite a few, including uh, Khalid El Marwani and Raji Khatri, is about the uh, blood transfusion shortage with the influx of many patients. Um, what could have been done better um, about uh, the, the blood situation? Doctor, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Safadi. So uh, because of the pattern of injury, so this was a supersonic wave that hit across miles of the city. So the injuries were mostly, the, the thousands of injured were injured by glass uh, shrapnels. And these uh, first uh, entries to the hospital were residents of the neighborhood around the hospital. They just basically came in walking. And those had injuries, but not to the point where they exsanguinated. So luckily, uh, most patients did not have injuries enough to require transfusion. I would say less than 5% of those that we treated required blood transfusion. And in that sense, we were lucky. Uh, doctor, uh, here, here's a question for that. I think it's really good by Deborah Cools. In retrospect, what supplies and resources were most critical? Blood, intubation equipment, wound supplies. I'll give this to Dr. Hobala and then Dr. Juvelikian. We had issues with blood transfusion at some point. Uh, we had uh, a couple of uh, patients who had uh, the brain out of the head that bled significantly and we were barely able to catch up with, with their needs in the operating room. 
Uh, so uh, having uh, uh, blood available and having uh, donors immediately present themselves, which we did have, uh, is essential. And despite that, we ran into some uh, blood shortage. We did not have any issues with equipment for intubation or, or dressing or wounds, but uh, this may not apply uh, to our hospital. Other hospitals may have had that, uh, that issue. Yes, uh, that's, that's correct, uh, Dr. Habballah. Uh, at St. George, because the hospital was affected drastically itself, we ran into problems with uh, the um, 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 essentially uh, equipment needed for the intubation and for hemostasis, but mostly intubation. So uh, actually uh, one of our ER uh, physicians, uh, uh, Dr. Dow, he had to use the same blade on more than one patient even without uh, being able to uh, clean it up. Uh, so that did actually come up in the uh, immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the explosion. In terms of blood transfusions, no, that wasn't a major issue, but uh, like I said, uh, many of our patients were uh, stabilized uh, uh, enough to be transported and transferred to other facilities. So, um, but, but yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the padding and the uh, suture lines and everything to just stabilize patients, we needed that and also with the intubation equipment. All right, uh, Dr. Safari, I'll give you this question. Was there an, any increase in COVID-19 among providers, victims, or other citizens in the weeks following the explosion? I know it's kind of hard to decipher that from the actual evolution of the pandemic, but uh, you know, do you think there was any increase in COVID-19 um, exposure and, and infection? So uh, that's, in that question is by Dr. Mark Malangoni. Uh, yes, Dr. Malangoni, how are you? It's been a while. Dr. Malangoni was one of my mentors and he still is. So uh, we tested everyone in our facility that was exposed and we saw no COVID exposure. So we had our N95 masks on and we, we did our best to protect ourselves. And in that sense, we were lucky. Now, it just happened that in the few weeks that followed, the number of COVID cases all over Lebanon and over Beirut rose and we've had some exposures, but we did not tie them to the uh, resuscitation rate. Dr. Balcher, I have a question specifically to you. It says, interesting statement about imagining worst case scenarios. How do you find a balance between imagining these scenarios and feasibly choosing which ones we put the most effort into preparing for? Another way, you know, we want to prepare for the worst case scenario, but we also want to balance that with the most likely scenario to happen. And how do you play that balance when you're preparing? Yeah, no, and I totally understand that. I think you want to, the first thing you want to do is do really a, a hazard risk assessment for your region, right? So what's the most likely thing to happen? And, and, you, and you do have to look at, you know, what is, what is in your port? What, you know, what, are, what, is it, what industries are around you for those types of things? But, you know, it might be that the most likely thing for you is a hurricane or an earthquake, right? But then, okay, so you've decided, like in Seattle, it's an earthquake, right? We know that's the the, the most likely really big bad thing that could happen to us. So then we, when we prepare for that, we have to think about what's the worst thing that could happen in that earthquake, right? What, what if our major trauma center is destroyed? You know, what is the backup plan? Where can staff function? How do we evacuate a hospital? I mean, I think those are things, you know, when I say imagine, it's not just imagine rare things that could happen, but imagine in something that might happen, what the worst thing that could happen in that is so that we think through those uh, events as well. All right, I have uh, two questions from Habiba Park, which I actually think are really, really important. Uh, I'm not gonna direct it to anyone. I just want you to you know, open your mic and start talking. The first question is, how did you maintain reliable identification of those who underwent surgery or were, you know, were you know, presented to your hospital with, I mean, it was a three second explosion with 6,000 patients showing up to the hospitals and after five, 10 minutes. So that's the first question. And the second one is from Habiba, how did you ensure scene security and if at all at medical facilities, especially in the early phase where you did not know what's going on, was there any military law enforcement and civilian collaboration or hierarchy? So open your mic and let us know. In our situation, the first uh, few minutes were very troubling because we could not really get patients to be uh, registered well. But then later on, we had to use 
uh, pieces of paper, we had to use bracelets, and this is what we had to go with. Uh, we could not really uh, uh, do but that. And then we ultimately got them into some special electronic medical numbers uh, that help us in identifying the patients and matching them with the results and x-rays. So this is uh, what we did. As far as trying, uh, all of us have uh, special doors to our emergency rooms, and, but we did not have major help from, uh, from the uh, from, uh, uh, military uh, security. So it was really the security officers of, of, the, of, the, of the university that were trying to control the gates. And that can be a problem when you have uh, areas of conflict and you have military individuals bringing their uh, comrades or friends or whatever to the hospital. That could sometimes create issues. I'll, I'll just comment that we've run into that registration problem before as well. Uh, and we have a plan to basically ab abandon the electronic health record uh, in, in these events. Uh, and in our emergency department, we have big boxes full of file folders of paper charts with, with, with new num unique numbers and uh, with um, you know, armbands so that each person, you can just grab one of those, stick it on them, put the chart on the bed, it stays with them. And that's the best way until you can you know, in the aftermath, go back and figure out who's who, basically all do you know, fake names, but they're, it's the best way to sort of keep them uh, uh, distinguished through the process. And we do it all on paper. Yeah, we yeah. also have to rely on the, uh, the paper identification, paper charts. Our radiologist had the brilliant idea of writing down names and brief reports on the patient's skin. So let's say, brain CT normal or left pneumothorax, and that helped us quite a bit. And here I have to uh, mention something that there are a lot of people that we as physicians and healthcare providers don't really take for granted in, in such circumstances, but they're extremely helpful and we cannot do what we did without their help. I'm talking about janitors who clean uh, from one patient to the other, of people who bring us supplies, of administrators who follow one patient after the other, checking on their names, and double checking their ID, et cetera. You really need an arm of an army of support. And uh, whenever we imagine drills, uh, all the healthcare components should be present in the drill. We, uh, a couple of our elevators got jammed. They fixed it within 10 minutes. So uh, these things are extremely important in the setting. Yeah, um, in, in our situation, it's a bit different. It was a bit different. Uh, the uh, uh, labeling was not a big issue because we just need to stabilize pay people and send them to other facilities, but we did uh, uh, have problems with securing uh, the, uh, the areas. And uh, one of the points that I put in the uh, uh, things to do or the lesson learned uh, later on is uh, a, a function of uh, the uh, uh, security personnel. In the first two hours after the last, we couldn't get assistance from uh, the outside world, if you will, not just because no one was available, but because mostly there was uh, uh, damage and debris everywhere. Most of the major streets were clogged and the vicinity of St. George Hospital is, a, uh, is not a highway, it's a, it's a one-way street all around it. So it can, you can imagine how easily it can get clogged. So um, having people, uh, mostly from the security personnel, take care of uh, uh, securing the hazardous areas. At the same time, trying to secure the facility, uh, the sensitive parts of the security, and take, uh, take care of patients and uh, uh, personnel. That, that proved to be a bit of a challenge because uh, you're stranded. Uh, what you have is all you got uh, until, can, until help can get there. And that took between two and three, two and a half hours. The, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to start to give up on the idea of we'll be able to answer all the questions because they're coming at a faster pace than we're answering them. But here's a question. No, no trauma talk goes without somebody mentioning damage control surgery. So I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Bulger. The question is, can you comment on the role of damage control or other tactical st surgical strategies in the management of trauma patients? I know that also is a maybe two hour seminar by itself, but maybe you can give a quick uh, overview of what's the role of damage control in such situations. Uh, I totally agree that in, this, in these types of scenarios, you, you are in a damage control mode for pretty much everything that you do. You, you have to do what needs to be done to 
stabilize the situation, stop the bleeding, stop you know, major spillage from uh, the gastrointestinal tract, and then get out, leave the belly open, come back another day. Um, the, because you know there's incoming patients, you know that your resources are limited, at, you know, time matters. So as a surgeon, the most efficient thing you can do that will uh, you know, get things under control and then, and then do all the complicated repairs in the next several days. So there's five minutes left. I want to acknowledge two heroes of preparing for this webinar who are Tony Ortiz and Kathleen McCann. They're like in the shadows, but nothing would have happened without them. But then I would I want a, a final comments and an answer to specific question that many people have asked about. People are watching. It's horrific what they're seeing and everybody in their seat and in their corners of the world are asking how can we help? So I'm going to start with the way we did the presentation. Dr. Habala, final comments, and then how can people help? And then go to Dr. Safadi, Dr. Juvalikian, and Dr. Bulger. And we have one and a half minutes. That's it. I think we still need major support for our supplies to be replenished. Uh, I think that's going to be a very essential thing for us. We don't need uh, surgeons or physicians, but we need uh, major uh, help with the supplies to come to the country and major international help into the political situation that's currently existing in Lebanon. I also would like to mention something that uh, very quickly is that uh, a lot of the credit also goes to the initiatives of the people on the ground during this event who took the initiative to carry the patients, bring them to the hospitals and some of them to carry them to other hospitals up to 20 kilometers away from Beirut. I think that helped us you know, offload our capacity and helped us in, in many ways. And a lot of credit goes to those smaller hospitals within Lebanon and within the periphery of Beirut, even up to 20 kilometers away from, from us because they really helped us in offload and uh, taking care of patients that could be transferred. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to Dr. Habala's question. Uh, I think a lot of the credit goes to the Red Cross. I think they did a lot of the work behind the scenes and they coordinated the transfer of patients all across Lebanon. I saw in one of the questions that uh, a lot of the private doctors took care of patients in their own clinics and I, and, and th those were also very helpful. I echo Dr. Habala that we need the uh, medical supplies. We also need help in repairing uh, the damages that took place in, uh, in the hospitals. And uh, the Lebanese people are creative, they're hardworking, and if we just have enough uh, political stability, we can do the rebuilding ourselves. And we thank the uh, we thank you we thank the international community for their support. Yeah, I guess uh, the, the same goes for us. I guess it, it, one of the big differences between uh, our hospital and the other major hospital is that ours was hit uh, to an extent that was uh, in unimaginable. And uh, uh, yes, uh, everything that was mentioned is uh, very uh, applicable to St. George Hospital, but believe it or not, uh, our uh, uh, rate limiting step at this moment at St. George, besides the availability of uh, resources and uh, the financial component is <laughs> elevators. We had 16 elevators, all of them, um, uh, all the doors were blasted, their uh, 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 chips were uh, damaged by the uh, hypersonic wave. And uh, if we were to have uh, the resources available today, it will take close to five months to have the uh, elevators uh, back in uh, full force for a 15-story uh, hospital. So uh, it's, it's funny when, when you end up being limited by something as uh, trivial as an elevator. But uh, yes, these are things on the ground and uh, these are challenges we're meeting every day. Dr. Bulger? Uh, well, I... I don't know how I can answer that, how you can help, but I do think that um, my hope is that that everyone that's watching will take some of these lessons home and think about, you know, what they can do in their own community to to be better prepared. I, you know, I really do think that if you look at how trauma systems have developed, it's been driven by surgeons. I mean, it's been driven by the people who take care of the patients and see the need. And so I think that, you know, our, as a surgical community, we can be leaders in our communities in disaster preparedness as well. We can help push the effort uh, forward and, uh, and hopefully uh, prevent some of these events in the future. 
All right, I, uh, I think that brings us towards the end. I think I speak on behalf of everybody who was listening. Uh, really, I, I wish this was not the COVID era where you could just reach out and shake all your hands for the amazing heroism. You're all such humble. I, I know from other people who told me about the heroic stories, each one of you did as well, as well as many others in Beirut in those days. And I hope next time we, uh, we have a webinar, it'll be a much better times for all of you. So again, for everybody who joined us, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you joining. And, uh, and again, thankful for Tony and, and Kathleen for, for arranging this and, uh, and for all your questions and engagement. Take care and see you later.